Good morning. It's great to be here. Uh, this is the first opportunity I've ever had to formally be a provocateur. And I'm going to take that opportunity to have uh, that job description very seriously. Uh, I don't usually provoke as, as much as I intend to today. Uh, it's interesting, and it's an honor to be here in this great cooperative partnership with, with China playing such an important role and so much uh, other participation from around the world. Uh, the Chinese government has come to visit our work in Tree People many times, bringing uh, leaders in education and government. And they're always scratching their heads going, we don't see how the United States can possibly respond when uh, the people drive everything and everything is kind of in disarray. And, um, and I say, I know the logic is very clear that when, this, when the government of China says we're going to do it, they just do it. Uh, and in the United States, uh, well, the news looks like we have chaos. Uh, we have great climate denial right now as the official government policy. Um, and it's very disturbing to have a, a president who says I'm for change and now he's punished for doing the change that he said he was going to do. Uh, I couldn't agree with Nikki more in terms of the model that London set out for top-down leadership and aggressive leadership to make change. Uh, I wish it would work that way in the United States. We, we have great not so much great elected leaders, so we have some good elected leaders, but our local government staff and uh, commissioners and people throughout the agencies, they get it, they want to do it, but they don't have permission to go as, as aggressively as they need to. We need leadership, but as you saw yesterday with the American election, if you move without the bottom-up support, it, you get bit. And uh, the kind of climate leadership our president was attempting to do, and he was barely going there, is now probably toast for another, for years, because of the, the constant fighting, the constant lack of agreement. So my job in this session is to very quickly lay out a foundation for the bottom-up approach. We've seen the top-down in its great form uh, from London and other cities around the world. Uh, we have been in Los Angeles leading a really interesting partnership where we are crowdsourcing. We are uh, working very quickly at times. We've shown it's possible to, to work very quickly with the whole population, moving from the bottom up. When government either doesn't have permission or needs protection from the public or needs, what we say is for the public to create the demand for policy, create the demand for the legal change in the regulations. And how we do that uh, has been working in partnership with government agencies, both the city and the county of Los Angeles. A uh, couple very fast examples where we've made the, the kinds of radical changes that we have to look at. Because when you look at all the great science that was shown to us yesterday and how refreshing it is to be here in a community of people who aren't in denial about climate change, uh, we, have to, we, we have to take action quick. And I actually, I keep looking over to our, our colleague from Australia and say that Los Angeles, Australia, other cities in the Mediterranean region are experiencing, uh, and I'm saying this to provoke as well, we're experiencing costly impacts from severe weather, early onset climate change now and today. And people are getting hurt, killed, and paying a price today that's not usually labeled as that. And we have this problem, certainly with the, the American politic, that 30 years, 50 years, is a religious notion that, you know, that climate change isn't real in their minds because everyone's talking about the future, rather than focusing on what's happening today. We're experiencing very, very big costs today, um, which, if addressed, and I'll close with that, actually produces the economics to, to make the change in policy. But let me back up just to give you a couple quick examples um, that I will really expand on at the last plenary session today with um, slides and video uh, to take it much deeper. But very, very quickly, Los Angeles is now the leading city in solid waste recycling in the United States. 
It uh, has the most aggressive program. It's one of the largest programs in the country. But it has the most public participation. So it wouldn't matter how great the infrastructure was that the city built, how fancy the bins were, or how great the trucks were, if the public didn't participate, we wouldn't have a program. And when Los Angeles set out to begin its recycling program, it only expected that it would ever grow to 10% participation in the public, because all the policy makers and the engineers believed that people would not change. They knew that they could not lead lifestyle change with the public. And so they had been afraid to adopt the policy for recycling. They planned to build big incinerators. The problem is the community said no to the incinerators. No burning trash in our neighborhoods because you're going to give us cancer. And they let us build a huge environmental education program. And they paid for it. And so we had a small program. We reached 30,000 kids a year with the city's funding we grew that program to 125,000 kids a year. We had two years to achieve a radical change in personal lifestyle and family behaviors that people thought was un it was unthinkable. We used the concept of critical mass um, to reach nearly 25% of the youth population of Los Angeles in order to have them reach all the kids so they would reach all their families and cause their lives to change, their lifestyles to change. Here's our challenge. In Los Angeles, we have over 225 nations living there. We're the largest Asian city in the world outside of Asia. If the mayor speaks two languages, he or she can't reach the whole population with the leadership that's needed. But through working with kids in schools, we were able to conduct our education program in six languages, including Mandarin and Cantonese and sign language. The kids took the message home and we had them, first of all, we gave them the message that they were in charge, that they were going to be the ones who were the managers of the environment because government had, had abdicated the role. That if anybody was going to fix it for their health, it was up to them. So they were motivated. We used their anger. They went home and they dumped trash on the floor. They taught their families how to sort it. Parents complained to teachers. <laughs> teachers complained to principals. Principals complained to the city saying, make them stop. They're making us recycle. <laughs> the city said, shame on you. Keep, up, keep going. And we did. When the city program rolled out, we, we reached 250,000 kids in two years. They took it to the 600,000 kids. Those kids took it to the 3 million people and their families. The LA population participated. Remember, they expected that they would never reach 10% when the whole program was fully formed. Immediately started 90% participation. And it stayed there. In the top 50 cities in the United States ranked in sustainability, Los Angeles comes out number one in only one thing, and it's this, this solid waste recycling. Because not only did the families change their lifestyle and do it quickly, they stuck with it, and they've stayed with it, and they've demanded, the public has demanded a better and better program, and our current mayor has built a more and more robust program. That's just one example. But when we extrapolate that out, what happened is when people started doing it, it gave the mayor, it gave the city council the courage and the permission to then expand the policies. And so we, we can't leave off the bottom up. Uh, and sometimes we can't even start without that. So I'm making the case to invest in that. That kind of basis of policy support from the public um, has helped the great scientist government staff to work much more aggressively. But our job as, an, as a nonprofit, outside from the bottom up, has also been to play another role in integration. So we have all these different agencies in our government that don't work together. Different water supply agency, different from flood control agency, different from sanitation, 
different from air quality, different from wa water quality. They were all functioning in their own silos. And in doing that, we are losing the power of a combined economic approach. So every single institution was building its own infrastructure, maintaining its own infrastructure, and didn't have enough money even to meet the regulatory objectives and their job. So all the agencies were coming up short, and they, but nobody was in a position of seeing the whole. There was no vehicle for integration to see that water supply is linked to water quality, is linked to flood control. We'll show how all that works in the afternoon session, but we were able to work with our different government agencies. We raised the money from private sources and then from federal agencies and local agencies to demonstrate that it was technically and economically feasible to completely retrofit Los Angeles. So from the format that what Nikki talked about, we've got old infrastructure that is so destructive to the environment from transportation, air quality, water quality, water <laughs> supply. We showed, we raised a million dollars from private and various agencies, conducted a, a very deep, conservative, cost-benefit analysis and showed that it was technically and economically feasible to capture all the money that was being wasted through agencies not working together, through their lack of cooperation and coordination, and produced a budget possibility that showed that we were hemorrhaging billions of dollars. And it was powerful enough that when we wrapped that up in showing how when you retrofitted through this integrated approach, it saved money. One government agency, the Los Angeles County, said, after resisting this, they said, let's give it a try. And they have been working with us on retrofitting an entire portion of the city, one huge neighborhood, 80,000 residents. It's a watershed with a flooding problem. They were going to build a storm drain to fix the flooding problem at a cost of $50 million. The result of the integrated plan was the design of a $200 million forest being put in instead. Why a forest? Because it saves energy, it captures water, it prevents floods, it cleans water. But it was going to cost $200 million. The thing was, when we did an integrated cost-benefit analysis, when all the agencies could see that they had their own dog in the fight if we put it all together, instead of just being a cost of 50 million, with only benefit being lack of flooding. When we put it all together, there was a $300 million payback to the city of Los Angeles and the county of Los Angeles because that forest of trees and forest mimicking technologies, which we'll talk about in the last session, it saved the city $30 million to not have to pick up the green waste trash because that was being converted to mulch that was part of the water quality and water conservation. 200, nearly $200 million worth of water was going to be put back in the aquifer for local use that was being thrown away before. So because we did the hard work of the cost-benefit work and the engineering, bringing engineering firms in, we had a very sane approach and the agencies have joined the process and we're constructing. Many, many more stories to tell you, but um, I think that it's time to not wait. We can't wait any longer, and we, ha we can accelerate the process tremendously when we challenge youth, when we challenge the population to participate, participate responsibly, and when we keep them in the whole process as stakeholders, even in helping design policy. Thank you.